So if you're using our um, backstop liquid applied air barrier and you're adhering foam to that wall and then of course the brick and so on, in addition to it being in combination with an EVES project, that entire wall is warranted material and labor by Drive It. So what New Brick offers, we offer standard and custom colors. We have multiple textures, very, very similar to conventional brick. Uh, we have shapes. We can give you special effects. And again, it could be installed directly over our EVE systems, or it could be direct applied. I think uh, so far we've done just about all four applications, or four of the six applications that I'm going to be showing you. OK. So basically what we do is we give you an insulated, high quality performance, which brick does not give you. Of course, brick has to have a cavity and has to have insulation within that wall. Okay. The actual brick itself is with extruded polystyrene, which is our XPS board. A lot of people ask, what is the R value of the brick? The brick itself is an R1.4. It's approximately one and one eighth of an inch thick. And it's adding R point, uh, it should be R1.14 to your overall insulation system. So we were just talking a little while ago, I've spoken with a few people. If you are using it with a conventional EVE system, depending on what your bad insulation is, as long as uh, is in combination with the foam outside of the wall, that will give you your total R value, which we're going to get into. New brick could also be installed by anybody, okay? Uh, a lot of times uh, when I introduce a product like this to uh, masons, masons really don't like this type of a product because they basically feel it's infringing upon their industry. Whereas when I introduce this to EVES applicators, okay, basically what we've done is we've increased the amount of work that you could be bidding on. Uh, typically, when I did a little bit of research, I have found that on approximately 40% of all EVES jobs, there's some type of masonry. So every time you go to one of those EVES jobs, if you see brick and you're bidding the EVES, you can now offer your contractor, your developer, your owner, the combination of a brick wall with the EVES single source, one warranty. Okay, so one trade, one manufacturer, one warranty. We were getting into the different options. What you're looking at up there is, I'm sure if anybody here is a drive it applicator, you all know what Outsolation Plus MD is. We can install this over our Outsolation Plus MD system, Outsolation X, and our cement board MD. These are all Outsolation systems which give you a liquid applied air barrier, give you your R value, it gives you everything soup to nuts. The cement board, is something that has really come up in a lot of ways. People have asked us, can you do a cement board system? We offer it. We have a, C, a cement board MD system, which is a drainage system. That system does not offer insulation. Okay, that insulation would have to be within the studs. So basically, a cement board would be your answer if you were going up against a structural steel panel thin brick system. Okay, typically, those systems drain. They don't really offer CI. They can at a greater price. So that would be our answer to that. If you want to go direct applied over CMU, you can go direct applied over CMU. We have two options. We could add the backstop, or you could do it without the backstop. Typically, if you're adding backstop, okay, that's because there's water penetration issues. There might or might not be water penetration issues if it's new construction. Uh, we're giving you both options. Absolutely. <laughs> The question was, uh, the architect is always going to want the backstop, okay? So basically, you're adding the backstop, and to, to install the backstop over a CMU, it's typical to doing it with any conventional, okay, EVE system. You should really make sure that those joints are either flush, okay, or you're going to have to skim coat it with Genesis, and then you can go and add the backstop, and then you can direct apply the brick. Um, this job you're looking at right here actually is in Connecticut. This was one of my first jobs, actually. It was done by Mark Topham, who's here. He's one of our driver reps. This job was a tilt-up job, and it was supposed to be conventional masonry. The problem is, when the panels got to the job, they didn't have any wall ties. They left the wall ties out. So basically, they could not install the brick. So we gave them a solution 
to install our product over it, saving them pretty much thousands of dollars. They absolutely loved it. It's a gorgeous job. Um, the only thing we always say, if you're using a direct applied over tilt up, you got to make sure you prime that wall because if it's a tilt up wall, there's going to be conditioners in the foam, okay, in the form I should say, to release the actual precast panel. So you got to make sure you detergent wash that wall, okay, and then you have to condition it with prime it. That enhances, okay, your adhesion. Um, ICF is very, very big right now. There's uh, many manufacturers out there in New York that are supplying ICF with a lot of developers. There's a lot of high energy jobs that are going up. There's a lot of passive house jobs going up. You're going to see quite a bit of passive house jobs coming up. So this is one option to a passive house. What's nice about this is when you get that insulated concrete foam, okay, form, and it's installed, okay, you have to be very careful because some of those forms, they do have a tendency of buckling. But by adding a Genesis base coat and mesh on the outside of that ICF, you can install the new brick right over it. This has really, really, really taken off. So keep an eye on masonry projects with ICF because, again, what's happening with this is you're eliminating all of the hung lintels and relieving angles. Now, I'm not going to get into prefabricated lightweight panels because you guys don't do that, and that's your competition, so I'll leave that alone. Okay, but if you were, you could easily install this product over a lightweight panel, steel stud panel. Oops, let me see what guys. All right, so brick masonry 101. How many guys in here have installed masonry? All right, there's a few. All right, everything when it comes to masonry is basically coursing and laying out your job. So you really kind of got to know what you're doing. You got to know what your bond is. You got to know what kind of coursing you have. You got to know what the size of the brick is. Up here, you see up there, that's a, a stretcher bond, okay, or a half bond, running bond. You have an English bond, which actually has one header center of the actual brick. Um, what an English bond used to be is in the old days, they didn't have wall ties. So you'd have an eight inch wall. What they used to do is turn the brick in and have two layers of brick back to back. That one brick would tie the wall together. Okay, but we can give you that effect. Flemish bond is the same thing more or less as an English bond except it's staggered. You have to know the dimensions and the terminology of your brick. Okay, for instance, if you look to the right, you have your stretcher course, you have a soldier, you have a header, a rowlock, sailor, and a rowlock. These are all things you're going to be challenged with as you're bidding these jobs. Okay, so you really have to know, okay, where the architect is designing these patterns. All right. Um, brick are typically laid in modules of 4-8. I always say a 4-8-12. So if you're going horizontally left to right, you always got to keep yourself on a 4-inch. So you're measuring 4-inch, 8-inch, 12-inch, 16. That's the way your coursing is going to lay out. Okay, you should always course out your project, okay, before you lay that first brick, all right? Um, one thing I am going to tell you, because this brick is one inch thick, a lot of times what guys do is they measure it out based on a 4 8 12. You got to remember, where a typical brick is being laid outside of the CMU, it will end with a 4 inch overhanging that CMU or that framed wall by four inches, and then they're turning the next brick over and returning. Because this is one inch, you gotta make an adjustment. It's a three inch adjustment. So when you're measuring it off, okay, remember you only got one inch that you're ending with, then it's returning. That's why you have to course out your job, lay it out. Now typically, if this is a specified project, Okay, from the architect's standpoint, the architect is going to basically course it out. So all you got to do is look at the plans, okay, and it's going to be coursed out. But if you're switching it from a conventional job, you got to make sure you allow that adjustment. Because if not, what's going to happen is if they lay it out to the module I just told you, and you get to that window, you're going to be one inch or three inch off. So you got to accommodate that one inch. Okay, so. For all intent purposes, we make four sizes of brick. We can make any size we want. Okay, so you're looking at a modular brick, Norman brick, econo brick, utility brick. So because that's what we produce as a standard item, I'm showing you what the coursing is. 
All right, so for instance, if you have an eight inch brick, okay, it basically takes three courses. If you wanted to turn a soldier, which means that brick goes straight up, three brick will equal eight. That's where your coursing is gonna be on your heights, okay? However, the brick is eight inches, modular would be seven and five eighths, plus the mortar joint, three eighths, gives you your eight inches. So always remember, even though the brick might be seven and five eighths or 11 and five eighths long, you're accommodating a three eight inch mortar joint. So seven and five eighths becomes eight inches. 11 and 5 eighths becomes 12 inches. Again, you're on that 4, 8, 12 module. The return is 3 and 5 eighths, plus 3 eighths is 4 inches. So on your horizontals, you're always working on your 4, 8, 12 modules. You only have to lay out for your heights. If it was a economy brick or a utility brick, okay, your, the brick is 4 inches. It's 3 and 5 eighths, plus the mortar joint, which is four inches. That's the easiest brick to lay out because your height is a 4 8 12 and your length is a 4 8 12. Whereas if it was a modular size brick, remember, you're working on an eight now, okay, because three brick equal an eight. So sizes. Right now we offer standard sizes. What you're looking at up there, if I can get this proper, Right there, that's our typical brick. I'm sure everybody walked around and saw our stretcher. A flat brick is called a stretcher. The stretcher actually has a pre-grooved spacer in there, which is three eighths of an inch to allow for that mortar joint. So when your team is actually laying the brick in the wall, other than laying out the first course, as they're laying their brick, you already have your three eight inch mortar joint. Okay, now that doesn't mean you can go all the way up the wall without adjusting it. You're probably still gonna have to adjust it, but that gives you speed from having to worry about lining it up in the wall. Um, as far as our end brick and our corner brick, the question has come up, why don't you have the lip? The reason is, is because of the way it's extruded. Whereas we extrude a stretcher elongated comes out of the extruder like that. In order to get the finish on the corner brick, it comes out of the extruder like that. So what happens is, as you're seeing Eric install the brick as we speak, we put spaces in there. So you'll go out, you'll get yourself three eight inch spaces, you'll get yourself some smaller spaces if needed for adjustment. So I'm sure you guys know what spaces are. You buy your spaces, they're reusable. That's gonna be used for your corners. It's gonna be used for your ends. The question has come up, well, why do you need an end brick if you have a corner brick? Well, if you come to a vertical control joint, you're gonna need an end brick because you can't caulk against foam, okay? Or if you have a flanged window, flanged window, you go right into the flange. If it's a recessed window, you're going with the corner. A lot of guys, what they do is if they know they're gonna be on a 4 8 12 they'll put one guy in a saw and they'll cut him right in half. They'll just lay him out. Now, the nice thing about this is you could actually cut this very, very easily. You don't need a diamond blade brick saw. You can cut it with a rotary saw, a handheld, right there on a scaffold, pull it up, make your cuts. Very, very simple. The product is two pounds per square foot as opposed to brick, which is 35 to 40 pounds per square foot. So you don't need pipe scaffolding. You could lay this product up on hung scaffolding. You could put it on scissor lifts. It's very, very easy. Anybody can lift this up. You got a cap unit over there. Obviously cap unit will be for an overhang or a cap, okay? That cap unit will also be used to soldier as a soldier course coming towards the end of the building where you might have your soldier, you come, make your return. Now, you see a 135 degree there. That's great, very typical, okay? We can make any angle you want. So although our standard shape is a 135, there are times you're gonna see a 120, you might see a 137, a 140, 150. And just so you guys know, I was in the brick industry for 30 years. So I kind of know how these shapes go, especially on a high rise. They're gonna request a lot of different things. Um, just like the brick industry, a shape is a shape, and that isn't a standard item, they have to be manufactured. 
Okay, so we had a kind of a formula to get everybody to figure out okay, how to come up with the square footage. It's easy math. You got 144 square inches in a foot. Okay, so what I basically had told people is if you take a three and five eighths by seven and five eighths brick, okay, basically you're going to take that calculation with the mortar joint. Three and five eighths is four, seven and five eighths is eight. So you have four and you have eight. Okay, what's eight times four? Come on, 32. Okay, you take 144, you divide it by that number. That's your square footage. That's the way you calculate what a brick is going to yield you. All right, so doing the math for you, and it's, we, we provide this anyway, a stretcher or a flat brick is going to be 6.85 brick per square foot. That is without waste. Okay? Uh, to have a corner brick, corner bricks are measured by linear foot. That's on your height. Okay, the, a lot of guys just figure 4.5. The true number is 4.57. Okay, you always have to allow for way. So, a lot of times, if you're estimating your brick, you might be saying, I'm using seven brick. You might be saying, I'm using five brick on the linear footage. Okay, Norman brick, okay, it's 4.57, 4.57. Okay, so it's linear footage 4.57, and it's 4.57 brick per square foot. Econo, 4.5, corner three, utility, three, three. That's your calculation. I'm going to tell you. Always calculate 5% for waste, okay? Depending on how kooky the job is and how much detail in the job is, you might get more waste, depending on what the architect is designing. Okay, estimating mortar and your joint options. With this particular product, it's one inch thick, one and one eighth inch thick. So you're gonna yield in an 80 pound bag, okay, pre-mixed mortar. Okay, 40. So if you have an 80 pound bag of pre-mixed mortar, okay, you're gonna get 40 square feet. If it was 90, you're gonna get 45. If it was 40, you're gonna get 20. It's real simple math, okay? Uh, take into consideration mortar eats up 20% of your wall, which people don't know. Okay, so really that's, that's a large percentage of what your wall is. You could add colored pigments. I don't like colored pigments. I never like colored pigments because quite honestly, depending on who's mixing it one day from another, it can, that color is a disaster. You just go out to any mason yard. You can buy pre-mixed colored mortar. Uh, we say you could use type S or type N. I'm an advocate of type S. All right, the reasoning is there's a, a question mark people have indicated that type N is more flexible. We're not looking for flexible, we're looking for flexural. Okay, type S is more flexural. There's a difference between the two. In addition, type S mortar shrinks less and it compacts better. So when you're mixing your mortar with our new brick latex additive, it increases the bond strength. You use type S, that decreases the shrinkage, it reduces the porosity, okay, and it makes the wall stronger. Okay, joint options. Because of that little lip that we were talking about, you cannot have a rake joint. You can't have a V joint. Okay, you're limited to a concave or a flush joint. Okay, we could put up there, and you probably can do a grapevine joint. That's something that they do a lot down south. I don't know if they do grapevines up here. I know on some residential jobs, you'll see a grapevine joint. You don't typically see it in New York. Okay. You see that guy on the right? That guy's carrying full-size brick. You don't have to worry about that because those brick are four pounds a pop, okay? Our brick, okay, are two pounds a square foot, okay? So think about that. That's 40 pounds a square foot versus what we are, okay? Two pounds a square foot, okay? So this is the key thing that you really want to look at here. This is everything you want to know. Okay, going back real fast, you know how to get your mortar, you know how to get your brick, okay, you know what sizes you got. Coming up over here, that's what you want to know. A typical crew is three men, okay? 
So one crew will yield when you get the hang of it. You probably, if you've never done this before, especially the tuck pointing, your production might be a little bit less. You're gonna get 200 square feet per eight hour days. That's a three man crew or roughly 66 square feet per man. The nice thing about this is that you don't need two mechanics on the wall. It is so easy to put this in a wall as long as you have one mechanic who lays out the wall, you could actually have two laborers, one mixing the mud, the other one following the mechanic. So let's make, let, we'll use imaginary numbers. If you're, and don't laugh, okay. If your mechanic is $50 an hour, okay. Typically on a masonry job, that's two fifties and one twenty-five. Okay, because you have two mechanics, 50, 50, 25 for the laborer. With us, you're 50, 25, 25. So your overall labor savings is increased because you don't need that skilled labor. You need that first guy to lay it out. Now, by the way, as, as I'm talking, Eric is actually doing the installation. Okay, and you know, you could... <laughs> so he laid it out. And you're going to see how he coursed it out afterwards. When I'm done, you can go up and ask him any questions you want. If anybody wants to get up and stick it in the wall, be our guest. Okay, you'll see how easy it is and how good that stuff sticks. Okay, uh, these production rates and hours are based on our Outsolation Plus um, MD system. Okay, so what does it include? If you're going over a typical EVES wall, okay, and this is what the difference is. Okay, if you're going over an eaves wall, all right, typically when you end at your base coat, what are you putting over it? A finish, okay? You're just not putting a finish. What you're doing is you're adhering brick and you're tuck pointing it. The brick is actually, think of it as the finish. So you already know what your labor is up to that base coat, okay? So this is based on applying the backstop, the aqua flash, the insulation, the brick tuck pointing and cleaning. That's everything included, that's your production. So typically people will ask me and they say, well stop, what if we're just going direct applied? Okay, so what, how much is that? It's approximately half. Because half your wall is up to that base coat in man hours, the other half is gluing the brick tuck pointing and cleaning it. So if this was a direct applied project, your production on a direct applied would be 400 square feet a day. Okay, it's 200 when you're including the system. All right, basically materials required. You guys know all these materials. Okay, you could use Primus or Genesis. You could use it wet, you could use dry mix. Doesn't matter, one way or another, you could use it. Okay, we have our pre-mix. You're gonna get a pre-mix type S mortar. You can mix it yourself. I'm highly suggesting you just get a nice quick crete or a spec mix, pre-mixed. Type S, it's all screened, nothing to worry about. Just mix water in it. And really the way you're gonna mix it is you take a, take a five gallon drum or a one gallon drum of our ad mixture. If you have an empty five gallon pail, put a one gallon in the pail, fill it with water, and then you mix it in your mud. Easiest way to do it, you can't mess it up, okay? Uh, so basically, obviously, you need your field brick, your corner brick, you need your end brick. Uh, if you need a shape of 135 degree, go to it. And if you need an edge cap, that's fine. As far as selection, we have 16 standard colors. Okay, uh, we can make custom colors. If anybody has ever seen our 288 brick catalog or color catalog, we can make any color there. We can match any color. Right, we offer three different textures, wire cut, smooth, okay, and velour. We can blend, okay, and we can give you all sorts of effects. We can actually give you an iron spot. It's not an actual iron spot, it's not actual iron, but it's a simulated iron spot where we put black fleck in it to look like an iron spot, all right? Um, as far as blending when, and being calculated, we don't blend, we can if you want us to. You really should blend yourself. It's a lot cheaper if you blend it than if we do but I would definitely consider taking a look at the cost on both and you'll see blending in the field is going to be less expensive. Okay, tools. I don't have to read them all out. I think you guys know what the tools are. Okay, but that's your checklist. You just go through everything. Coursing, we got into coursing. 
So you want to establish that master row. Now what you see up here, this is right out of the BIA, okay, Brick Institute of America. They're working the walls on 48 inches, four feet, okay? And that's what you want to lay out. You want to lay out your lengths and your heights. You always want to start from the outside of a corner in. You don't want to start from in to out. Because if you have to make the cut on an internal return, you can make the cut and kill it. But if you start inside and you get to the end, you don't want to have that little piece at the end of your wall. So it's always suggested you lay out from the outside coming in. Okay. Do not assume the lowest common corner of the building is the best starting point. Okay. I've seen a lot of guys start laying this that never laid brick before. I have always, as a brick mason, taken it from the top of the windows down. Okay. Or from the floor lines down. Okay, because you want to have a true 8 inch, okay, or a true brick on the top of your window. Typically, windows all line up on their heights on a building. Okay, you'll see, well, hopefully, right, yeah, because sometimes they're all up by a few inches um, or a few, whatever. But to make a long story short, if you, if you stop at the sill and then you go to the height of the window, you're going to have a problem. So if you take it from the window height down, Always remember one thing, you're going to have a sill or a row lock. And that's where you're going to make your cut or you're going to hide if you're off a little bit. All right? And that's basically what you weren't here when he was laying the project out, but Eric laid this all out and he is dead bolts on. Okay? I mean, he will just run that up. He'll take his uh, level every now and then. He'll measure every two feet just to make sure he's cost. He'll add shims as, as he needs them. Okay? And you'll see that wall is going to come out absolutely perfect. So again, guys, lay out your job, figure out your windows. Door heights don't typically line up with window heights, but window heights are pretty true on a project. Okay, you'll always see that the bottom of the windows will be altered, okay, but you don't really see that the heights of the windows. Okay? Um, make sure you locate your head joints, so on and so forth. Okay, you can get jack arches. Okay, you can get circular arches. What we've done here is we've teamed up with Acrocore. Acrocore um, does our drive a shape pro program for us. They'll be coming on after me. Uh, I thought it would be really neat because they do jack arches for us. Uh, they do sills. They do all sorts of shapes for us. And I thought it would be great to do this presentation showing you a jack arch. You could put a keystone in there. You could have a sill. You could use a row lock if you want without brick. But typically in a residential job, you're going to see that you're going to have some type of cast on. So by driver teaming up with Acrocore and manufacturing these shapes, if you go to a masonry job, you're going to see cast on or limestone as your accent banding. Okay? You can do that with us. So there would be a conventional brick with limestone or cast stone. Well, we needed to answer that. So with Acrocore, we answered that. So now your entire wall is an eaves and a foam wall. And it's one manufacturer, single source. All right? Now, what you're looking at Eric doing right now, when you're applying the adhesive, you want to be vertical. That trowel should be on a 45. OK? You can, doesn't matter if you go from the bottom up or you go top down. Okay, but the brick actually drain behind the brick, in front of the foam, and behind the foam. So unlike our EVES systems where it drains behind the foam, this actually offers drainage in both the front and the back. Chances of water getting behind the foam are very, very slim. Okay, so you're draining from two different locations. Uh, the reason why you don't want to go across, because you don't want to trap water. So any type of residual moisture that might get in that wool, if you notch trowel left and right, you will get some effects. If free store, you might lose a couple of brick. Okay? Um, you could actually do a, a ribbon, which you just dab two ends of the brick, but we don't recommend that. Now, a lot of guys in the brick industry that's done thin brick, they put two dabs at the end of the brick and they stick it in the wall. We still prefer that you do it our method. Okay, so again, blending. When you're blending your brick, you're gonna get boxes. These, actually, we eliminated the box, we now have straps. So they're gonna come in straps of brick in a bundle, 
okay? We want you to work for multiple bundles. If this was a conventional brick, you'd be working from two or three pallets, and you'd be coming downward on it. Well, we kind of want you to work for multiple boxes, okay? Because remember, it's a manufactured product, so depending on how it's being extruded and how much finish is actually going on the unit itself, although very accurate, you can have a little bit of inconsistency, so we do want you to work from multiple boxes. In addition, if you're blending your brick, when you order your brick, you just give us the percentages. We'll make sure it's shipped with the blend that you want. Lay it out, take a look at the wall, make sure your blend is proper. Just do it the right way the first time and you'll never have a problem. We already got into the fact that the corner brick and the end brick do not include the spacing lip. Um, we are looking into a different method of a corner brick right now where we actually miter it and then finish it using foam to foam. If that should happen, there will be the spacer on the return. But for now, you're using spaces as you see Eric doing. All right, setting the brick, guys. There you go. Nice and easy. Now, the one thing is, in your heights, as you're measuring off, you might dip a little bit in spaces depending on how the wall is going. Again, you could use those smaller spaces just to bring yourself up a little bit, all right? But as far as horizontally, if you're running off, there's two things you can do, okay? What is acceptable by ASTM standard is your mortar joint cannot be less than a quarter inch and cannot be any wider than a half inch. What does that mean? If you're running off, okay, or you're getting too tight, you could either tighten the mortar joint or you could open up the mortar joint. That is always favorable. If that's not going to work, you could always cut the brick. My suggestion is that if you have a long wall and you're running off, don't put the cut at the end. Put the cut all the way up the middle. So let's say you were off by an inch and you needed to make that one inch cut. If you hide it in the middle and be consistent all the way up the wall, okay, you're not going to pick it up. If you're losing something in your height, the nice thing, we, we, we were just talking about window heights. Carpenter goes in there, that thing is supposed to be plumb straight across, but that window and that window are off by a quarter inch. That's why architects love soldier courses, because you could lose it in a soldier, okay? Or you could lose it in your cast stone, or in that particular place, your arch. What you do is you just cut it. Just cut it. Just cut the hip because it's 8 inch, 10 inch, or 12 inch on those type of heights. So if you're losing 3 eighths of an inch, you're not going to put a sliver of a brick in there, especially if it's 2 and a quarter inch. What you'll do is you'll take it out of the soldier. You won't pick it up. Yeah. All right, so tuck pointing. All right, so what you want to do is when you're ready to tuck point or apply your mortar, the day after, 12, typically 12 hours to 24 hours, so really it's the next day, you want to make sure that wall is dry, you want all the moisture to get out, and then you want to tuck point. So you really shouldn't be tuck pointing the same day. You want to tuck point approximately 24 hours, okay? Um, Mix the borders described in section three of our application guide. We pretty much went through that. You want to use a number five tip, okay? Uh, what you do want to do is, you, uh, right there, you want to do your horizontal joints first, and then you do your head joints second, okay? Because if you're doing your head joints first and then second, you're going to pull the mortar out. So always do your horizontal joints first. Uh, you want to make sure you overfill the mortar joint. You don't want to be scared that the mortar is too thick. Because remember one thing, when you're striking the joint, you're compressing the mortar. You want to compress the mortar. All right? If for any reason that mortar is too wet and it starts dripping, let it drip, back off, wait until you get the right consistency, go back. Never, ever, ever try to clean the mortar on that brick. Just clean it at the end of the job. Okay, because you're going to smudge it. Just let it go. It looks horrible. Just let it go and continue on. Okay. Uh, what is the consistency? They say like a milkshake. Okay. Uh, I say like wet beach sand. 
just where you're not getting water coming out of it. it. It's almost to a point where it's almost dry, but it's still pliable, where you can strike it. Uh, typically, in a few hours, you could actually brush off the excess water. You don't want it to get too dry because you're not going to be able to. If you strike it too soon and it's too wet, you're going to get a streak, you're going to get shiny. Okay? If it's too wet, you're going to burn the joint. So again, this takes technique. This is the thing here that you guys really need to know. The hardest part about this is the tuck pointing. Make sure you've got a good guy on the, on the line that's going to be able to tuck point and grout properly. And, and that is the perfect way right there. See what that guy's, look how overfilled that is. And if that is of the same, of the right consistency, it's not going to drip. He's just going to wait. He's just going to go up there and he's going to touch it with his finger. He'll know. And by the way, it takes your guy one time to screw up, he'll never do it again. All right, uh, here we go. Prior striking joints, okay. Make sure the consistency of the motor is correct. I, I could read it to you. Rake joints, before remember I told you the joints, never use a rake joint. I wouldn't use a rake joint regardless. Okay, it traps water and allows water to penetrate. Okay, cleaning and brushing. So, if you're doing a real clean job and you strike that, that, that particular job happens to be in Brooklyn. That wasn't cleaned. The guy just happened to do a real good job. Okay, and you can still see a little bit of mortar around the edges. If that owner wanted to, he can go back and clean it. Okay, but typically, if, you know, once they get the hang of it, they probably don't have to clean it. So, if you've got a good guy tuck pointing, you're not going to have to clean the wall. In your labor, you're going to figure you're going to clean. If the guy's so good, you're going to save yourself a few hours. All right, now this is very, very key. Uh, you cannot use muriatic acid. In fact, you really shouldn't be using muriatic acid on conventional masonry, especially with all the manganese that's in brick today. Okay, so basically you want to use Sure Clean 600. You want to use Vanitrol. Okay, you want to use Dietrich. I'm just giving you a few companies. Okay, Dietrich makes two products. 101 is like the Sure Clean 600. Their 102 is like uh, Vanitrol. I like Vanitrol. Vanitrol is a lighter detergent. Okay, it doesn't burn. I just think it's the best product. Even, even in my brick days, I always recommend Vanitrol or Dietrich 102. And it doesn't have to be these manufacturers. Okay, if you want to use another manufacturer, it's fine as long as it's comparable to these products. Now, conventional masonry says you really shouldn't be cleaning that wall until that brick gets hard, or the mortar gets hard, excuse me. So typically, you want to start cleaning that brick after 14 days, not to exceed 28 days, because once that mortar gets hard, you're not going to get it off the brick. All right. You're adding a latex additive to this. That's an accelerator. All right, so you best be sure when you're cleaning this, you want to clean this product because of the latex additive in seven to 10 days, not to exceed 14 days. You go over that 14 days, you're going to have a heck of a time trying to get that mortar off that wall. Uh, 10 to 1, and it all depends on the manufacturer. But typically, it's 10 to 1. Okay. All right, so what are the benefits of new brick? Now, this is where the cost savings is, which is huge. When you bid this out, what's going to wind up happening is you're going to see versa brick job, there's minimal to no savings. So a lot of times, what's going to happen is an owner's going to say, well, I get $30 a square foot for brick. You guys are $30 a square foot. There's no savings of going back to brick. Not at all. The savings isn't in the new brick and the installation of new brick. The savings is in the composite wall. When you eliminate the hung lintels and the relieving angles, when you take your steel studs from 14 to 18 gauge, your composite wall savings to that owner is 25 to 30 percent. Forget about the thin brick system to the full brick system. It's going to be a push. You're probably going to save a few bucks, but you're not even going to say it. That's where your savings is going to be. Okay, so we just addressed a few things there. You're eliminating hung lintels, relieving angles. 
You can go from a 14 gauge steel stud masonry, could probably go to a 16. You can go with an 18 to a 20 gauge steel stud because there's no weight on this. It's nothing, all right? We've already talked about the composite wall savings. That is, that's the sell point. The product offers continuous insulation. So whereas brick needs to have a cavity and has to have the insulation within the wall, all right, you have to accommodate that steel lintel and that relieving angle. So if a brick is four inches and it has to have CI and it has to have a two inch foam to meet the requirement, okay, we're in zone four, so you need two inches, okay? That brick being four with the one inch cavity is five plus the two inches, five, six, seven, that's seven inches of steel that has to carry the weight of that brick, okay? There's no steel needed. That wall is two inches plus the brick, which is one inch, that's a three inch wall. Your footings shrink, you're saving money on the footings, okay? The product meets all energy codes, it meets the NFPA 285, um, we offer two different types of systems, which we discussed before, the Oscillation X system, okay, or the OPMD system. Uh, you're getting an R3.85 on our regular OPMD system. If you want to use the blue board, which is the cavity mate, okay, that's an R5 for one inch. Now, right now, Mark and I have been working on a few really, really nice jobs in New York and in Connecticut. It seems that passive house is the big thing in the New York metropolitan area. These are high energy walls. I could rattle off a half a dozen, okay, developers and contractors that are using new brick because they do not want to use the steel within the wall. They just want to use a continuous wall of insulation. The new brick gives them that. They're not having any steel in the wall, it's saving them a fortune. Okay. The other problem with, um, with passive houses is they don't want to lose energy. It's not just uh, the savings of the money. Um, they're very conscientious about saving energy. So what happens is when you have that steel lintel, okay, they're getting dermal bridging. They're losing energy. They don't want to lose any. They want to use and save as much energy as possible. So with a continuous insulated wall, there's no energy loss. There's no steel. The wall is lighter. Lucky for us, we came up with this before passive house because now all of a sudden they just love it. So when you, when you see these passive houses, okay, you should jump all over it. When you see projects that have combination of brick and eaves, you should be trying to change them. You're gonna save that money to the owner. That's it, that's my presentation. Do we have any questions? I got off easy. <laughs> If you guys want to just get up uh, before Scott Bella comes up right after me, it's going to be Scott. But I would suggest everybody just get up and just take a peek if you can, what Eric is doing. He's actually putting a sill in there right now. Thank you very much. Within a half hour, I was kind of like, yeah, you know, I was moving with it. Then I basically messed this whole wall because we tried to give you a, a, a real feel for going over a CMU. Okay? Don't look at this as, as it was going over a, a drive it system. Okay, look at this as going over CMU. So in the upper corner, I kind of try to draw in a little bit what the block was. What we would recommend, again, depending on your situation, is that you're gonna take and you're gonna base coat over top, okay, to, to smooth out anything. So if you had a concave, if they had struck the joints, you wanna infill that before you stick the brick. You could just use your base coat to fill those in if you like. You don't have to use mesh. I like the mesh in all, in all situations. I just think that's that much better to the wall. Then you come back with your backstop, which is your weather barrier, okay? And that, again, that protects it, although CMU is impervious to water, I think it's a much better application again. It gives you the ability to keep the water from actually saturating and going in there, right. if there is any water that does happen to get through. Right. Then you just go to your vertical notch trowel. And on this, what I'm using, did I steal your thunder, Scott? Okay, I like adhesive-wise. We have four different products that we'll tell you you can use. Jenny, liquid Jenny, which you add a Portland cement to. You can use the um, Primus liquid. Jenny DM, which is a dry mix, and the, uh, and the Jenny, or the Primus DM. I like Jenny. I think Jenny gives you better adhesion. And I know what everybody looks at and asks. They're looking at this brick. 
and they're saying, or this brick, and they're saying, really, how well does it stick? I can tell you this. If I hit this wall, yep, they'll pop off right now because it hasn't had a chance to dry. But I will tell you, once this stuff dries, we do, when we up at the office, we have to do samples all, on the, all the time. And we do demos, either for customers that are coming in or training programs or for the sales reps, okay? When we come up there, we did, this was about four months ago, three months ago, and the guy was taking the wall down. He actually had to take a claw hammer, put it in, and pull it off. And what we found, it was actually starting to pull off some of the base coat off of this mesh, or if this mesh could, it was actually binding, or bonding really well to the mesh in the back, to the foam, but more so to the mesh. So my philosophy is the more mesh we have back here, the stronger it's gonna be. Okay? And we've met before, and I can't remember where. Triarch just dawned on me. I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed, but And again, I think Paul talked a little bit about the end bricks and so on. And again, that's just about the um, manufacturing process, how we have to manufacture this product, and so on. The other thing what you don't want to do, and I'm going to clean this off so it doesn't matter. What you don't want to do is this, okay? Because what ends up happening, it fills the thing in the back. We would prefer, we would like a drainage plane. So, if I take and just stick this, okay? It'll hold. See, it gives it a slight drainage plane. And again, this is gonna be for incidental moisture. This is not clay brick, where clay brick becomes saturated. It becomes, once it becomes saturated, it will not take any more water on. It won't take any more on. They need an air barrier back there to keep the air flowing to help it dry out. That's why the liquid um, vapor barrier there or air barrier or moisture barrier is great because it prevents the water from penetrating further and also then there's a drainage plane. But you're talking incidental moisture. If you're getting a lot of water into this, you've got a couple problems. Your problems are most likely going to be your surrounds around your windows, through holes, things like that. That's where your, that's where your water infiltration happens. And that happens in, in, in stucco, it happens in stone veneer, happens in all of those. <coughs> okay? So, again, you want to make sure that you're, that you're filling, or you're doing these properly, giving the proper exp uh, expansion joints, cock joints. Another question that a lot of times guys will ask, knowing the drive it system. Drive it system, when you're using expansion joint, cock joint, right? They tell you not to put finish in there, right? They want you to have a base coat. They want you to put primer over that. Does anybody know why? Because drive, it's really mean, right? Actually, it's not. Where that comes from is from the adhesive company, the, the, the sealing companies. What the sealing companies are saying is when you put that finish in there, you put the sealing in there, it doesn't bond as well to all of the aggregate. To me, it took me a while to actually grasp this. I'm like, oh, no, it gives you something to wrap around and hold on to. Absolutely not. Smooth surface, it gives it a whole surface to adhere to. That's why they don't want a finish in there. But we've gone to them, we've had it tested. This is an acceptable material to adhere your sealant to. Okay? The other thing is, why do we use back rod in the back of the sealants? Okay, a lot of people think it's a couple reasons. One, it's a filler. Two, it's, it adds a little bit of space. The third thing is, sealants are designed to only adhere to two areas, okay, two spots. So if you have a side of side in the back and it's adhering to all of them, it has a, literally it has a two and three chance of failing because one of those threes are gonna fail. Which one's gonna fail? The sealant is designed to be like a rubber band. You pull it and it springs back and forth. You can do it here and here, here and here, okay? 
but you don't want to do all three. And the sealants won't adhere to the back rod. Okay? Anything else? Okay, and the other thing is, and what I did here, and this is where I take suggestions, because some of you guys have worked with some materials I haven't. Okay? I'm a salesman by trade. I've learned to use a hawk and a trowel for 15 years as a sales rep for a distributor of the Drive It brand. Okay? I learned one thing. I can talk to my applicators, and you guys know a whole heck of a lot more at times on how to do the mechanical things. If you have suggestions, please let us know. Okay? Also, you'll find that sometimes you'll get a dip in your wall. Okay, it's great to step back and look. Where we, we, where our guide, okay, the lip or the guide on this is fantastic because we can keep setting. Helps very well. But sometimes these aren't perfect, okay? We don't live in a perfect world. So sometimes you can get a little bit out of skew. The best thing to do is either step back and take a look at it, take a side view and look down the side and you can look and sometimes you can see it do this, okay? Constantly measure and constantly use a level to check it out. What I've done here is I've just put eight inch marks. So that tells me every three courses I should be real close to that, okay? I should really should be right on when I end up my lip should be right about there with that. And that keeps me up, which will tie me up to right about here. Okay? Other great thing about this product, and I had it happen down in Philadelphia. Um, they were doing an end of a house, or of a, of a, it was actually a complex. They didn't know where to start in the bottom because all the windows were kind of screwed up and they weren't able to lay it out right in their minds. So what did they do? They put a starter board at the top of the window. And they worked up from there. So they started the top of the first floor windows and window, or I mean and door, and worked up. Then they come back and they work down. Okay? Show me a brick, a clay brick that you can work from up here and go down. Man, you guys are awesome. Okay? It's one of those things is it's a great advantage. Starter boards, and if you look here, I just put a piece of, of foam across the bottom, okay? Starter boards are the greatest thing. Even if you're up a couple, a couple um, courses, you put a straight edge starter board across there. That's the cat's meow for you. That's the best way to get this going, and it's the best way to make it work right. If you don't have a starter board, I can guarantee you what? You're screwed. Plainly. And guess what? About this level, you're going, oh, shit. Pop, 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 and you're starting all over, and you're cleaning it off. So use a starter board, okay? The other thing I will tell you also, lay out your job. Spend the extra hour, two hours, three hours to lay a job out if that's what it takes you, okay? Do, do, just do a physical layout. I spent some time with a, a, um, a mason who's been doing this for 30 plus years. And I'm sitting there watching him and he pulls out this board. Pulls out the board and I'm looking at it. What the heck's that? He goes, that's my story pull. I says, what type of story is it gonna tell us today? Story pull basically told him every course that he uses for brick. And he can sit there and he can set this on there and he knows whether it's lined up. So when he does his corners, he knows they're lined up, lined up, then he throws a straight line. We don't have the ability to pull a straight line because of some of the things that, you know, again, if you do that, you'll, you could pop this off, okay? One thing, though, I am playing with, and I'm going to play with it at one point when I get the chance, is after I lay my, my, um, my mortar on the wall, okay, I want to take a string line across it, have somebody at the other end that I can just snap, and it'll snap a line right into my mortar for me so that I know I'm right in line with that every eight courses or every eight, eight inches or three courses or even if you only want to go every 24. You can make up that difference. Okay? And I think as Paul instructed you guys, you can make up a lot with this, especially east and west. I come up and I was a little bit too wide over here, so I made some minor adjustments. You've got that ability. 
and it makes, a it makes it so much easier for you. And when I'm laying these and I'm using my spacer, okay, I'm using my 3 h inch spacer. Figure out which side you like to work from, left to right, right to left. I don't know where the young gentleman was that was up here. And I showed him, when I move from my left to my right, my spacer's in my left hand. Why? And my box is in my right. Why I pick it up, bam, stick it. This one's stuck, I reach down, I grab the next one, stick it. The other thing is, I hold in the bottom, and I hold in the spacer area. Makes it real easy. My thumb, as big and fat as it is, slides in very well underneath the other one. Goes in really easy, real well. Okay? So it's a very simple, if you have to make a slight adjustment, moving a little bit left and right, you're not going like this, you are moving it left and right. It's going to give you that adhesion. Okay? Um, again, you can see I always carry a multiple of, of different spacers. If I have to make up a, a 16th, okay, I don't have a 32nd, but I have a 16th, and I have a variety. 3 eighths is really my, my, my main play here. Okay? Big question that people want to ask is, what happens if I get the Primus or, or, or Jenny on the face of the brick? Sucks. Actually, it doesn't. What you can do is what I would tell you. Don't let that dry for two, three days. You do, it's going to be a bear to get it off. Let it set up and dry for a couple hours. Then what you want to do is pull out a spray bottle. If you can, come up, spray it. So if I'm taking this, it's on there, and I got some on there, what I would recommend, spray where it is. With your hand, hold this down. Take a brush. Here, here's a good example. You guys see that? Let me see if I can do it, I'm not using my spray bottle. pretty much off okay I went a little bit quick with a spray bottle then you can saturate it and it'll, it'll run off when it comes to the mortar and I got to tell you mortar isn't working for me tonight okay sometimes I when I buy the pre-mixed stuff sometimes it, it doesn't work well it, it, it bonds up really fast to get it out of the great grout bag I'm not gonna sit here and screw this wall up over that it's not worth it okay but if you get mortar on it everybody says how does it clean? I can tell you, first wall I ever did, I did for another di a distributor in Pennsylvania. This is a week after I was introduced to this. I'd never used a grout bag in my life, except for making cakes for my daughters. <coughs> Quite evident that I'd never used a grout bag in my life. <laughs> I had grout everywhere on that wall. And I think about the only place I didn't have it was in the joints, okay? What I did do is, I tried to clean it off too quick, so it was still very wet. I struck it and it was all over. Well, I had this brilliant idea. I'll scrape it off with this. I'm going on an angle so that I come across, I'm not hooking in there, next thing I know, it's coming over the face of the brick. Even a better idea. I grabbed a brush and I started brushing and it coated the whole thing. SureClean 600 did a wonderful job on that. Wasn't perfect, but I can tell you after that, I learned how to grout properly. I learned to let the joints set up. The other magical tool, if you're doing this, or not if, but when you do this, the magical tool is a zip tie. That's a $50 tool I'll sell you every day of the week. Okay? Make a zip tie, make a little loop. If you take that and you come across the joint, you're knocking off the excess, so it's almost flush. Then when you come back and strike, you strike and you only have a little bit that may come out. You have very little to clean up. Okay, then you can come back with your, with your tool and just scrape off the little excess after it sets up a little bit more. And then when you clean it, it is easy. And I mean it, it's easy. You fly. You fly with it. Um, and I think Paul addressed this issue again with your layout. You start from the top of your window and you work down. It makes a big difference there. Okay. 
I became this, my wife thinks I was sick or something. We're driving, I'm stopping and taking pictures of brick jobs. And the one that got me, you guys are all familiar with the East and you get that critical light, you know, where it shows every flaw in the wall. I had my day with brick, I was excited. Pulled up to a, um, it was a Chick-fil-A in, in, in just south of uh, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, coming home one evening, and they had the lights on there on the wall. It showed every, the bricks doing this. They weren't flush, I'm like going, ah, oh, that's our comeback now to the, to the brick industry. Look, they're not perfectly flat. You can say about our eaves, but here you go, okay? And again, remember this, brick is not perfect. Clay brick is not perfect. The joints aren't perfect. They get stuff that comes out on the face of their brick too. That's what makes it look more authentic, okay? And I can tell you, we have a job that we're doing in Brooklyn right now. I actually, actually Paul's running it right now, I think. This is part of that job. Is that Paul? But this job here, and you can see, that's, that literally, that's in seven stories. The reason they did use, use the new brick on it, they wanted to keep the, 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 the deck or the roof, because the, the tenants are going to have access to that. They wanted to keep it looking as much like brick as possible. Okay? But they didn't want to add the extra money, the cost, to put in the additional supports that they need and so on, and actually take away, because they were going to have to drop it seven stories to carry the load the way the walls were designed at that point. They went with this. We have had two sets of architects there, and one of the, the first one that walked up said, yeah, well, where's your stuff at? He's looking at this, we say, that's it. No, he says, but where's this new brick stuff at? That's what's here. I don't understand. Where's your new brick at? Because that's the brick. He said, no, that's new brick. And when they cleared the corner, it still hadn't been, been uh, the, the joints hadn't been filled, not all the brick had been put up. He got it. He got it. I think it, they were talking about an 80,000 square foot job at that point. Okay? I'm telling you when, you, when people see this and they understand the, 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 the CI code, the continuous insulation code and what's required, that's where this thing's gonna take off. And that's where you guys are gonna have a golden opportunity because guess what? This commands more money to be paid to you guys. Really, it does. Commands more money. This is a quality product. There's nothing else like it in the market. And guess what? We can do something that brick can't do. We can offer the continuous insulation. And you guys, I'm telling you, you have an opportunity because like any of our specialty finishes, you should be getting more money from that. Because if you're not, you better hire a good salesman. Because you can't get the quality, you can't get the look for the price that you can be charging for those products. This is no different. This is no different. Don't take into the account the price of the brick. That's not what this is about. That's not what this is about. This is about meeting a need that nobody else can meet right now and giving them a product that looks like brick, acts like brick, feels like brick. And I can tell you this, Drive It's only going to get better with what they're generating for you on this product. Right now, people look and say, oh, well, you only have a couple textures. Yep. But guess what? The brick's been in business for 30,000 years. Jesus was, I think, amazed when he saw those blocks. And he said, I think my dad may have created that. Okay? Well, guess what? This is only a year. And we're getting better. And people are starting to take notice. People were, we actually had a guy post something on um, LinkedIn last week. He had a Mason supply house from in Texas call and say, I want that. I need to distribute because he had two of his customers calling him, do you sell this stuff? Where do I get this at? Through LinkedIn, something so simple. Other questions? You guys are too easy. Sorry? No, the car no brakes there. When you broke them up. Can you speak English? Yeah. <laughs> you have very little of a seal there when you grow them there to the raw sprout from the corners. Yep. Is that gonna is that sufficient? Yeah. Nope. They've tested it all. That's one thing drive it will do. 
they put it through their accelerated testing. They send it, they send it out for, for, for the fire testing. Everything gets tested. Before they put it on the market, they will test it. And they'll put a couple hundred thousand into their testing on these products. It's been tested for the joints and that. Now, I think Paul may have addressed it in the mortar. When you're mixing your mortar, okay, we have a, we have a, uh, a new brick ad mix. It's a four to one mix. You take one gallon, you put, here's what I recommend you do. You take one gallon, you pour it in a five gallon bucket. You take four gallons of water, pour that in there, mix it up. So when you're mixing your, your, um, your mortar, you're just dumping that in. You're not taking guesswork. Well, yep, that looks about right. This looks about right. It's easy if you're mixing in a five gallon bucket. All you're doing is picking the bucket up. Once you get your consistency, put your lid back on your bucket and you continue back through it. Anything else? That's the only question. That's the only question. Yeah. No, and that's that's legitimate. That's a lot. We get that all the time. We get the well. You know, how's it gonna? Okay. It bonds. I've got a couple of these samples are, are mine for my truck for my calls. I had somebody the other day look and says, well, look at this, it's cracking. I said, let me tell you what, it's been in my truck for almost eight months. And it gets thrown around, things get smacked against it. And it's on a flexible board. If it's bonding and you only have a slight little crack like that, you'll have that in brick, too. Actually, I had an architect look at me and says, look at this. It looks so authentic. It even has, you guys even put a crack in there. Yeah, we did, just for you. Well, here's, here's, this is starting to run out just because what I do with, my, with my, uh, my Jenny, I make it a little bit wetter. I find it's better. And you only want to work a couple feet up, a couple feet over, okay? I have this really dumb idea of having a machine that I can slide these through and they slide out with the ribbons on it and you just pick them up and you put it in there, you know? But yeah, you, again, you got to keep moving with it, and you know what I would tell you, it's like anything else of our products. Um, in mid-August, on the south side of a wall, you want to start at about 5.30 and you want to end at about 9.30. Sets up rather quick. You know, again, if you, it, but, I, but again, I temper it to make it a little bit, uh, uh, a little bit more wet, okay? Makes it, and honestly, I think it makes it easier to work. It sticks a little bit. If you've got an area that you don't have that, if you don't have the support under it, that will cause it to sag. But I can take this brick here. Actually, if I put it on there, that's not going to sag on me. That's had a chance to set. Okay. Had I put that on earlier, it would have started to do this. It would have moved down about like that. The other thing is that you can learn is sometimes if you're starting to dip a little bit, what I will do, so I don't have to use a shim. I'll take the brick, and I'm going to exaggerate this. I'll take the brick, the brick above it, and then I'll push it down. And what happens is it pinches a little bit of the base coat in between that. It'll create just enough of a lip, enough of a gap in there, okay, to bring you back up to level. Nifty little thing I just happened to come across. I'm, 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 I'm falling behind and I put up and I, and I went like that. And I said, now, I said, oh, now I know why. And I got away from some of the shims. Especially that you're, you're talking a sixteenth of an inch at most, 30 second. That brings you right back up with it. Can you hear me in the back? Can you hear me? <laughs> We're good? Okay, thank you uh, everybody. Uh, I'm Scott Bella with Drive It Shapes by Acrocore. We are manufacturers of pre-coated shapes and pre-coated starter boards. Um, and briefly, if you look at the wet wall and you look at the amount of brick that you see here relative to the pre-coated shapes, well proportionately my presentation will be that much shorter than Paul's. <laughs> what do we have? We make pre-coated shapes and pre-coated starter boards. 
Uh, we're not here to reinvent the wheel. You all know uh, what a pre-coded shape is and a pre-coded uh, starter board is relative to what is done on site when you're field applying. Everybody knows the differences between the two. I'm here to talk about why we differ as driver shapes and more importantly, the benefits of driver shapes. We like to think our company is unique in that <clears throat> the three principles, myself being one, I've uh, been an architect for 25 years, practicing in New Jersey. Jack Solick is uh, here, my partner. He's been manufacturing pre-coated shapes for over 20 years. And our third partner, who's not here, has been a 30-year builder of custom homes in New Jersey. Now, I don't tell you our credentials to impress you, but rather to impress upon you that we bring a lot of experience to the table. And when we think about making shapes, we don't only think about the manufacturing process and making a quality product, but what we think about is how are we going to get this thing on the wall cost effectively. So we make a product that is aesthetically pleasing. It's very durable. And using Derivit's material uh, is bar none the, the best quality shape base out there, in our opinion. So basically, what we have developed if you all know that drive it specification does not allow for a molding longer than 48 inches. So that didn't necessarily work for us because we're all about labor savings and how quickly can we get this on the wall cost effectively. So what we've done is in our manufacturing process is we've developed a way to make an eight foot length and still meet the 48 inch specification. So we have a, what we call a relief cut in the foam at 48 inches, and then we manufacture a 96 inch or an eight foot length of molding. Now you're putting up eight foot at a time as opposed to four foot. Half the time of the job, again, you have your lab labor savings. Currently, uh, putting a pre-coated shape on the wall is, and, and most of you have done this, I'm sure, or, or know better than me, I've never put a pre-coated shape on the wall. But what I have seen is that you base coat the back of the shape, you put it on the wall, and then in some fashion, everybody does it differently, you have to temporarily hold this shape in place until the uh, base coat dries. So what we've done is we've developed or created what we call a cleat system. We haven't developed the cleating uh, technology. However, we have cut out the back of our moldings and developed a foam design cleat that will will do for you is we call this a temporary hold. You would put up an eight foot uh, length, uh, wind lock it to the wall, strike a, a, a line around the building, basically wind lock this all across the building, now you're ready to apply your shape. So basically you're base coating and you're hooking onto the wall. Now you're moving on to the next piece. Base coating and hooking, base coating and hooking. You're not nailing, you're not putting wire uh, mesh up there to hold this up temporarily. So basically, once this cleat is on the wall, that job is moving so quickly. And you don't have to wait for it to dry because our temporary hold is there to do that for you. In addition to that, what we've done with our shapes is we offer two different ends. We've pulled the mesh back two and a half inches on uh, one side where you can mesh that joint and then base coat it in the field by simply taking the trowel and riding it along the profile shape to create that joint. Or you can do a standard butt joint. You obviously have to still mesh that, bringing it down um, and feather it out. It's all a matter of what you're used to uh, in the field. If you prefer to have the, uh, um, the mesh pulled back, it's a simpler joint for you, that's wonderful. What we tell our customers is that it's, it's, a, it's a per job basis. Whatever, whatever the job entails, that's what you're gonna do. If you have a lot of short pieces and a lot of cuts on a job, we recommend going with the butt joint because you're gonna be cutting this stuff up on site and you're gonna have a lot of these butt joints, you're gonna be used to doing it and feathering it out. If you're running a banding around a building that's a thousand linear feet, you might wanna think of doing this because you could basically put up all these eight foot lengths and uh, run your same joints all the way around the building. So again, we're constantly thinking about labor savings and what is going to be easier for the installer when it's up on the building. In addition to 
pre-coded shapes, we are making um, pre-coded uh, starter boards as well. The benefit of the starter board, as you know, in terms of labor savings, is it obviously goes up a lot faster than back wrapping on the job. You take 10 8 foot lengths of starter board and wind lock it to the wall, and in about 25, 30 minutes, you have 80 linear feet of starter board on the wall. Think about how long it takes to back wrap mesh coat uh, on site 80 linear feet. So the time savings is incredible. And the same rules apply to the starter board as they do to the shapes in that we do manufacture this in an eight foot length. There is, you probably can't see it here, but there is a relief cut in the center that will be finished on site. There's about one inch left to make that little slit. And now we meet the drive it specification uh, for the 48 uh, inch length boards. We do. This, is a, this happens to be a two inch, but we do from one inch all the way up to six inch. We've been asked for thicker, but we haven't gotten there yet. But yes, we do all the thicknesses. Um, our pre-coated shapes are basically all pre-ordered to, 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 to be made. Uh, every shape is going to be different. Our starter boards are an inventory item. Century is stocking starter boards currently today. Shape. Yeah, shapes, uh, a, typical, a typical shape order is usually seven to 10 days manufacturing and then we ship out. So it depends on how big the job is. It could be three to four days and we ship out, or it could be two weeks, depending on how many pieces there are. Um, so again, uh, Century is now stocking uh, starter boards. Um, I think Vito's in the back taking orders, uh, if you want to pick some up. Uh, so essentially, again, our company, um, is always thinking in terms of construction, how it's going to benefit the job. Uh, starter boards, as you know, uh, I have brochures, we're gonna be handing them out later, but starter boards, many of you know, are um, not only at the base of the building, there are 23 different um, conditions where starter boards are being used throughout the building. Around windows, soffits, at the base, uh, vertical joints, so essentially the time savings, uh, instead of pre-wrapping on the job, is really uh, beneficial when you're using a pre-coded um, starter board. Scott, yes? Two other things, one is that it's always perfect compared it's, to having your, your guide down the bottom. It is. Trying to do it. Number two, it eliminates the need for either starter track I was or just, just thinking of that, yeah. So, so good point. Um, the uh, pre-coded shape is always going to be um, consistently made. Consistently, you'll have the same thickness throughout. If you have a guy trying to um, uh, finish off uh, pre-coated, uh, I mean, a, a back wrap shape on site, it's going to be messy. It's not going to be as um, good of quality uh, as, a, as a shape. The uh, starter track is eliminated when you use the starter board. With the vertical trowel pull, you're going to have your drainage in the back. We cut out uh, a little notch in the back, so you're going to have your drainage come straight down and out the bottom of the uh, starter board. So you eliminate the starter track. It also, it also forces you to stagger the foam joints on the sheathing joints. That's correct. So yeah, you do have that stagger as well. Not, not everybody does that, but you're supposed to. That's right. Any yes. So yeah. So all, all around uh, good quality, but in terms of uh, construction time savings, that's what we're all about. We are now. Um, Finishing up uh, tooling for what we have uh, is a new window corner, pre-coated back wrapped window corner. This is a game changer. What we have found is people don't want to uh, back wrap and have a very difficult time getting this corner around the window. So putting this up and then matching it to a starter board, your windows are going to be done in no time and you're going to get the quality of a three millimeter thickness of polymer infused cement uh, shape base that drive it is providing us as opposed to uh, a one millimeter pull on the uh, you know a field applied back. So you're also, you're also ensuring that you have a sheet rock cut as the manufacturer recommends you're not supposed to have foam board joints in a corner. Correct. So you're making that so you never have to worry about it, especially with third right. party you have third party inspectors and they take them out and they pick that up because they don't really know what they're doing and they read the drive, they drive the rules and they say, oh, now all of a sudden you have like a quarter of the building done and they yep. fix it up. Now all of a sudden they say, now they want to look at everything. Now, now we're it. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah, so, so in addition to uh, the shapes that we're, we're showing you here tonight, I just want to talk a little bit about what Drivet is doing uh, when using uh, pre-coded shapes, starter boards, uh, and now the window surrounds. Is with a standard uh, insulating system, outsulation system, 10-year warranty, if you use starter boards, Drivet shapes starter boards, and or starter board shapes, Drivet has taken that 10-year warranty and jacking it up two years to a 12-year warranty. That we find is a huge benefit um, when talking to building owners, architects, um, and you know, all around um, telling customers that you know, we're a good quality product and we're going to last. You know, we're willing to give you two additional years because now you have a whole system that is a 12-year warranty as opposed to the 10-year warranty and then putting on a, another company shape uh, where, you, where you don't necessarily get that warranty. In addition to that, um, Drive It Shapes is ICC code compliant, which is very important uh, in terms of you know, when, when architects are specking a job and they want a code compliant shape, they're looking at Drive It Shapes as opposed to someone down the block who is just making them out of their uh, garage. So basically, uh, that's all I have today. Uh, I will be here, uh, Jack will be here as well to um, answer any questions that you have about any of the shapes before you. We have uh, a bunch of samples in the back and a bunch of um, uh, brochures that we can hand out, uh, my cards as well. Uh, again, Century is now stocking starter boards. Go take a look at them. Uh, pick up three or four, try them out on, on the next job. And we assure you that the next time you come back, you're going to be buying a crate because they're just that much easier to work with. And what we have found as we roll out this um, starter board program across the country, once it's used, they're going to use it again, and they're going to keep coming back to buy it. Uh, again, labor savings, uh, good quality product, drive it shape base, drive it materials, um, and of course, 12-year uh, warranty as opposed to 10-year warranty. So, any questions? Yeah. We're going to be. This has just been approved by Drive It, so we are going to start this program uh, as of today, and this will be stocked. In, Century will be stocking this, as well as uh, a lot of manufacturers. Uh, I'm sorry, distributors. Yeah. Any other questions? Thank you. All right. Thank you all for coming. I want to thank both uh, Acrocore and Drive It. Let's give them a big round of applause. <laughs> Thank you for a wonderful job on the wall. Paul, wonderful presentation. Thank you, Scott. Thank you.